Today's gospel reading comes from the book of Mark 12, verses 13 to 17. They sent some of the Pharisees and supporters of Herod to trap him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're genuine and don't worry about what people think. You don't show favoritism, but teach God's way as it really is. Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay taxes or not? Since Jesus recognized their deceit, he said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a coin, show it to me. And they brought one. He said to them, whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they replied. Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. His reply left them overcome with wonder. This ends the reading. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning on this day when we celebrate religious freedom. We celebrate independence from a foreign nation. We celebrate hope, but most of all, we celebrate your word. And we celebrate your presence through this communion that we'll take in a few minutes. Now, Lord, help us to focus on your word and what you have to say to us today. May we hear it with open minds and hearts. May it be given with inspiration and hope. So, Lord, help us to hear and to listen clearly. And we pray that the words we hear are your word and not the words of any man. Hear us, O Christ, in the name of the living God, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Speak to us. For the past 16 months, American Christians have been struggling more than usual with the concept of separation of church and state. On this Independence Day, I want to explore the question of the church's independence from a biblical and constitutional perspective. In our, co in our country's history, rich history, since Roger Williams founded Rhode Island, a fundamental premise of American culture was the separation of church and state. Williams opined in, uh, that an authentic Christian church would be possible only if there's a wall of, or hedge of separation between the wilderness of the world and the garden of the church. He believed that any government involvement in church would corrupt the church. That's the foundation of our early colonies after the Pilgrims and the Puritan settled Massachusetts. And in 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. In it, he declared that when the American people adopted the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, they built a wall of separation between the church and state. Now, let me say that as far as I research, Thomas Jefferson was no friend of the church or of the faith. In some ways, he was a heretic. In 1820, Jefferson published The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, otherwise known as the Jefferson Bible. He took a razor and glue and cut and pasted extractions of the doctrine of Jesus. The Jefferson Bible excludes all miracles by Jesus, and most mentions of supernatural, of the supernatural. He even excluded sections of the four gospels that contain the resurrection and most other miracles and passages that portray Jesus as divine, according to a well-documented article in Wikipedia. In his gospel, Mark in chapter 12, which we just read portions of, tells us how the Pharisees and supporters of Herod tried to trap Jesus by trying to trick him into making a treasonous statement. At this point in Mark's gospel, 
It's after Palm Sunday. And Jesus make, is making a scene almost every time he enters the temple, which is several times this week, uh, of the week of Holy Week. The Pharisees and the Herodians are very aware that Pilate is in the city, and he's there because during this week of Passover, insurrection is more possible than other times of the year. The Passover, in many ways, is Israel's Independence Day. They don't want an incident that would create civil unrest. Jesus responds to the trap with an important statement that clearly evades the trap and frustrates the conspirators. They ask him if the law, now that's the Jewish law, the Torah, the laws of the Jews, allows people to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Now if Jesus responds with no, he would speak treason against Rome. If he responds yes, he would be supporting the Roman occupation, which the Jews hated. They thought it was, the, the Herodians and the Pharisees thought it was quite a conundrum they had created. But Jesus navigates through the trap. Why are you testing me? He asked. Then in verse 17, he tells them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. With that statement, Jesus, at least for me, defines a fundamental relationship between the church and the society's ruling government, any societies. Basically, he establishes the separation of, of civil and spiritual authorities. So Jesus, God on earth, recognizes that church and state were not one entity. There was no church state uh, that would develop later than in Christian history. Let me say that again. There was no church state that would develop later in Christian history. Not from the church's perspective. It may take one over. There was no church supported church, as was the case in the day, in the colonial days. You see, the Jewish leaders and the followers of Yahweh really could only exercise their authority to worship Yahweh, their God, because the Roman emperor permitted it. The emperor permitted that, that worship of Yahweh to keep the peace because in the Roman Empire, the emperor was God and the occupied population was required to worship the emperor. That's really not much different from what we see in our world in countries ruled not by democratic methods, but by power hungry autocrats. Idolatry is still present in our world it takes on many different forms from, from creed, creed. No, let me say that again, because the, there's just a slight sound difference between C and G. From greed to seeking absolute power, the desire to dominate or idolizing and swearing allegiance to a political leader or head of state. Today, July 20th, 2021, we celebrate the signing of our Declaration of Independence. It was signed 244 years ago. It was a world-changing and altering act against the English crown. Much as in occupied Palestine in the first century, colonists were experiencing the heavy taxation of government that was not sensitive to the needs of the people in this new world. The British army kept the peace in the colonies and also kept them in line with the British government. To pay for it, the colonists were taxed heavily. The English crown knew that it was expensive to protect the foreign mission from foreign enemies. And so the early settlements in America were under the rule of foreign kings and queens, and they paid for it. And those kings and queens dominated the culture of our original settlers. For some, for the English, it was the Church of England. For the Spanish, it was the Roman Catholic Church. And in New York, a colony developed with no dominant church defining the faith. Rather, the colonies, the religion of, in, and throughout the colonies, the religion of indigenous peoples was destroyed. Indigenous children were removed from their parents and put in boarding schools 
where they were denied their names, their culture, and faith under horrendous circumstances. Incidentally, one of those schools was located not far from us in Carlisle. It was where Rothohek was educated. You remember him? Well, yes, you do. Well, you don't remember him, but you know him. His name, his English name, was Jim Thorpe. In New York, religious tolerance was dominant when the English took over and reformed the Dutch trading post of New, York, New Amsterdam into New York. New York, because it was a non-English speaking, had non-English speaking roots, was also had a very democratic culture. While the roots of the American notion of the separation go back to 1663, when the new charter of Rhode Island granted religious freedom to all settlers, the question of religious freedom in America was not really addressed in an organized way until December 15, 1791. Now I should check Christian history, or I should check national history here. What happened on December 15, 1791? I would guess some of you would know. I see a lot of head shaking no. On that day, Virginia ratified the first 10 amendments of the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights. The separation of church and state became the law of the land. And since that time, we've been struggling with, with what that means. Remember, these rights were only given to the descendants of white Europeans, settlers, and not indigenous people. So America, particularly the United States of America, was designed to tolerate people of most religious cultures. Since that time, we have struggled with what that meant. So let me give you a little quiz, and you can shout out a number here. We'll just play with this a little bit. How many religions and denominations do you think exist in the United States? 400. 400. Wow. She's high. Somebody else? Exists right now. 313. 313 different religions and denominations make up our country. They range from monotheists who, live, who, who believe in one God, like the Judean Christians and other traditions, to policy, uh, po polytheists, okay, I'm gonna have to ask Cassie to come up here and pronounce these for me, who believe in many gods, you know, atheists who believe in no God, or a God represented by animal spirits, alien groups are psychoactive substances, according to Procom.com. At the heart of our system is the ongoing question of what it means to be patriotic in a country and society whose very roots go back to European Christianity. How do we navigate the gap between allegiance to God and allegiance to country? And exactly what does it mean when we say one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Who's God? How does the majority religion work out its evangelical mission in a country that tolerates other faiths, even if they are non-Christian? To further complicate the matter, how do we as Christians live out Jesus' words in verse 17, to give to God the things that are God's, and to the government the things that belong to the government? In the early years of our country, there was a close identification with Christianity. Really, that existed for many years, though it has produced a significant tension. Should an atheist, for instance, be forced to say, so help me God, when testifying before a government agency? We look at other countries and shake their head and shake our heads. They persecute Christians who are coerced into pledging allegiance to a government that denies and restricts Christian worship with a penalty of imprisonment or even death to the infidels. As American citizens, American Christians, we struggle with our allegiance to our country and our commitment to God and how they work together. And here's a major point of contention. Let me give you an illustration. 
When I am asked to pray in public, let's say at a Burr Council meeting, that's an actual piece that I, I've done. Do I pray as a Christian to a group that mostly identifies as Christians? Or do I recognize that there may be in this civil gathering people who are Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Shinto, Sikh, and who knows what other variety of religious expressions, even those who believe and know God? I'm intrigued by the inclusion of Alcoholics Anonymous and how they provide for all people when they speak not of God, though they largely identify with Christianity, but of one's higher power. So am I patriotic or unpatriotic? Faithful or unfaithful? To my faith when I pray in the name of the living God rather than specifically the name of Jesus, who is my higher power? I often ask myself, if I were that person in the crowd, what would I experience? If I were the only Christian in a public gathering and a prayer was offered only in the name of Allah, or Kanesha, the elephant-headed Hindu god of wisdom, literature, and worldly success, how would I feel? What would be my thoughts? At the very least, I'd be very uncomfortable. You bet I would be. And I've learned to respect others when I pray in public in a diverse group. There are probably others in the crowd who do not accept Christ. They may be rooted in what I believe is an idolatrous faith, but I will not win them to the kingdom of God by making them uncomfortable. I can pray in the name of the living God because Jesus Christ is that living God and be inclusive at a public gathering. And just maybe as a result of that, as a result of my demeanor, I'll earn the right to have a conversation that will be fruitful for the kingdom. So we must first gain the credibility with our caring as Jesus cared for our, uh, care for our neighbors before we earn the right to address the deeper issues of life. I have more credibility with the way I live and my actions than with my words. I've always been patriotic. I support the Constitution and the rule of law. I recognize that there are times when I have to struggle with the fact that decisions are made that I believe conflict with my Christian faith. Now I know that many of us are in that position. We have different opinions about our life and our lives together. As I read the scripture, particularly this passage in Mark, it becomes clear that the church is not the government. The church, the body of Christ, is not called to rule the culture and the government. And let me say this. I know many of you are thinking, wow, what are you talking about? Well, I think about what if the dominant culture here was Muslim? Would I want them to have legal authority over me? The church's role is rather to witness to and flavor the government with the teachings of Jesus, Paul, and the church fathers, which call us to be in the world, but not of the world. And I would suspect that it has been corrupted when the church has been so close to the government. I think of the Crusades and some of the terrible parts of Christian history. Poet Brian Wren acknowledges that kind of tension and that kind of experience in his verse, Christ bears the church, corrupted or conforming, obsessed with trifles, blessing, greed, and war. His love outwits us, spinning gold from straw through saints and prophets, praying and reforming. If, as Christians, we're to be salt and light to the nations, we must do as the early church did. We need to recognize our authority's purpose 
and how we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Unfortunately, the present divisions in American churches over political differences do not speak well about who we are to non-Christians. As a result, our witness has been diminished. I came across some really startling statistics recently. In 2009, 77% of Americans identified themselves as Christian. In 2018, 2009, a Pew Research poll that was conducted found that 65% now or then identified and it's gone down since then. And the generation after them, Gen Z, born between 1997 and 2012, is just beginning to be a force politically and socially in our culture. What will be their opinion of Christianity? Will they be the wave of people who rebuild the church? Most of us will be long gone. But what legacy will they build on? What will we leave them? Will we govern a church that lives out its faith and compassion or where members can't speak to each other? Where they put their political preferences before their allegiance to God? That's not a good testimony to a splintered world. And just like the people of Jesus' time, we face a host of difficult choices every day. We come in contact with all kinds of things that demand our allegiance, telling us that they have to be our first priority. In our own time, the great theologian Paul Tillich talked about faith as the state of being ultimately concerned with something. Our ultimate concern is the thing that owns our first loyalty. It's the thing around which we orientate all of our decisions. Our ultimate concern is the thing we die for. According to Tillich, everyone has faith because everyone has an object of ultimate concern. It's just a question of what it is. Tillich's question is more or less a version of the question Jesus poses. To what or whom are we loyal? What do we really put first in our faith? What do we put our faith in? We, as Christians, are not called to offend our enemies, but to love them. And I know that's very difficult. Every time I say that, I think about the people who confronted me. You know, you mean we're supposed to love these people? Well, that's what Jesus says. I may not like it any better than you do, but that's what he says. And I've got to struggle with that if I'm going to deal with my faith effectively. I honestly believe, and deeply believe, that to be a good citizen, we have to have the same responsibility as being good Christians. I believe that, is part, that it's part of patriotism. That's at the soul of the United States, a country born of immigrants. Our attitudes toward people of other races, economic conditions, and religions are not patriotic when we call them names, demean them, or tell people of foreign descent, like all of us in this room, Go back to your own country. I don't know about you, but I'm at least a second generation locally born citizen in the Emmerich family. This is the only country I've ever known, though my family's roots are in Eastern Europe. This, this is my country. And by the way, I'll sing that proudly. So this week, be patriotic. Fly and salute old glory. Remember, seize your civil freedom and your spiritual responsibility. Love your country. But remember the first commandment that God gave us, you shall have no other gods before me. Remember Jesus' words, Give to God the things that are God's, and to Caesar, that is the government, the things that are Caesar's. In a diverse society, let us be strong witnesses to the unifying love of God in Jesus Christ as we love our neighbors, as we love ourselves. That's not only patriotic, it's the commandment of Jesus. And brothers and sisters in Christ, 
That, I believe, is what it means to be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Lord, help us every day to recognize that we are called to serve you and live our faith. Keep us, we pray, from idolatry, from the idolatry of placing politics above the responsibilities you give us. Help us to be servants who serve you above all else, even when that means taking difficult political stands. Help us realize, Lord, that we gain the world by serving you first, even if it means working through the prejudices and examining our loyalties. Lord, give us the strength to serve you first, to take bold stands based on your direction and be salt and light that marks real patriotism. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.